on just for a few seconds. Let's invite the presence of the Lord in this place. Jesus, we want you to be in this place. God, we want you to inhabit the praises of your people. God, I pray that you would loose a spirit of freedom in this place. God, I pray that you would loose a spirit of victory in this place, God. I pray right now, Jesus, that you would begin to touch every single person that is in this place, God. I pray that you would begin to touch those who are watching online right now. God, I pray that your spirit would just flow so freely in this place, God. I pray that there is just an unquenchable atmosphere of worship and of praise and of adoration. God, we just want to worship you. We just want to praise you. God, we just want to love you. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you, Lord, for another time that we get to have gathering with your people. Come on, if you are just excited that you woke up this morning in your right mind, why don't you give God a shout of praise? Why don't you give God a shout of victory? Why don't you give God an I love you shout? Why don't you give God a hallelujah in this place?
bless the name of the Lord. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. It feels good to worship God in the sanctuary. It feels good to praise his holy name. David said, I was glad when they said it to me. Let us go to the house of the Lord. We can praise his holy name in this place.
Praise the Lord Church. Now we've been doing analysis for a very long time. So today we're going to test how well our congregation knows what we're doing. When is family night prayer? Family night prayer is every Monday night at 6 p.m. When is men's prayer? Tuesday mornings at 5 a.m. Oh, set up to pray? Tuesdays at 4 p.m. That's right. Oh, wait. At City Hall. For midweek service? Wednesday, 7 p.m. That's right. What can you tell us about Easter? So it starts with Good Friday communion service, March 29th at 7 p.m. Oh, when is our free community event for Easter weekend? That would be on Saturday, March 30th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. That's right. Bring the kids. And when is Easter service? Sunday morning at 9 a.m. Lastly, when and where is Singles Conference? Uh oh. Uh -oh. I don't know. Okay. You should know this, you're single. <laughs> It's May 17th to 18th at Bellflower Church. Right. Alrighty guys, I hope you enjoy these announcements. Next time it might be you. Have a good one and I hope you have a good rest of the service. God bless and enjoy the rest of the service. AM, praise God, Brother JM had that answer down. Thank you, media team. Amen. These announcements are great. Every week we enjoy. Thank you, everyone, for taking part. Amen. As a family of God in these media announcements, it's great to see the variety of people coming through. How many enjoy the announcements each Sunday? It's awesome. Praise God. Amen. At this time, we want to give you an update on our uh, legacy planning for the 40th pastoral anniversary coming up. Uh, each week, we try to just give you a little bit of information that will be helpful to you. Amen. And so on the screen here, we see it is July 26 to 28, 2024. This is a great weekend of celebration. Amen. And it's Pastor and Sister Hodges' 40th pastoral anniversary. Do you love your pastor and pastor's wife? We love you, Pastor. We love you, Sister Hodges. You guys are amazing. Praise God. And so this is a very special time. And so we want to just give you an update and share some things that are taking place. Um, one of the first things I want to mention here, if you pull it up on the screen, is that um, we have these dates down, but we're looking at some things that are being covered. This is Friday night, this is Saturday, and this is Sunday. On, on Friday evening, the 26th, this will be an all-church banquet, very special uh, invite for the church family. And then on Saturday, for the ministry, all licensed ministry and their family. And then on Sunday, a very special celebration here at home uh, for South Bay Pentecostal Church for the 40th pastoral anniversary of the Hodges. And it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. Uh, what this is, if you're looking at, is this, this picture here is the old cabinets in the, um, in the church office. These are the old cabinets. Here's a picture of them being taken down. I want to thank Brother David, Brother Anderson, took those down this week. So the church office uh, is a mess, but pretty soon it's going to be a miracle. You're going to see it. And so let's do the other picture, if you will. I just want to show you. These are brand new cabinets for the church office. Amen. Now, here's something beautiful about this. These cabinets have been donated by a business friend of ours to South Bay Pentecostal Church. It's like $3,000 worth. Here's the result. We want to give God the glory. So not only are we promoting the 40th and not only are we working together to do it, but we are being good stewards and getting donations. Here's another victory report. You like victory reports? Amen. God is doing great things around us and around here. Praise God. And so also, uh, we've been in touch with the Head Start building, and the Head Start building has um, committed to pay for the painting of that building. So that saves us $3,400. So we thank God for that. So good things. Praise God. Now, the budget for the weekend of the 40th, it covers the banquet, special speakers, their hotel, their love offering. It covers uh, the banquet, which at this point, the pastoral staff, as we just came together, decided that there not be a charge because we were all giving as a family of God, and so there won't be a charge for the banquet. You're not going to pledge, and then you're going to show up, and then we're going to charge you for that banquet, okay? So we're trying our best to celebrate, and that night, uh, make it very minimum what work is done by the South Bay family because we want this banquet to be about the Hodgeses, our pastor, pastor's wife, and, and about us together as a church family. Praise God. So the budget for uh, that whole weekend, including as you've heard, 
uh, Executive Pastor Amado state a vision and also Sister Amber share a burden for the need and the desire to update South Bay Pentecostal Church's property. Amen. You, you've heard that vision and you've you heard that burden, that vision and that burden to update. So when we throw out the number of the budget, we don't want you to think, well, that's for that's just Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's not just Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. This is long-term. We're trying to take care of the house of God. When people come to South Bay Pentecostal Church, we want them to say, wow. Not only is that a great church full of great people, but wow, they know how to take care of their property. Don't you want that said about your church? Do you love your church? I love my church. I want that wow factor to be in people's hearts and minds when they pull into this property. So we're working hard towards that. Um, if we can display a list, here's a list of things that, as a part of the budget, which is 65000 by the way, many of you have already pledged, and it's great. We thank you for that. If you have not already pledged, at this point, we're just doing the pledge, and you can give to Legacy Online. That's where you can give your love offering towards us. But the ushers have pledge cards, and if you did not already fill one out, we'd like for you to fill one out, and at the offering, turn it in baskets up here so just raise your hand if you haven't filled out we're going to share some things that we're going to be working on to beautify the house of God we all know that we love our church and we all know that we need to beautify God's house and we're all for that but here's a list of things as you I mean how many are looking forward to owning our own South Bay 10 tables and 80 chairs not renting chairs and tables anymore for events so that's one of the main things on the list that's going to be covered I'm going to turn my back for just a moment or to the side to share this. Repair and paint front patio area. There's broken concrete. Paint black metal exterior doors on the front of the church. Foyer interior doors all in here need to be repainted. Those will get done. Um, install cabinets and flooring and paint walls in church and school offices. Paint walls in Sunday school office. Uh, build music stores. Our mu musicians, we love our musicians. Let's give our musicians and media a big hand. Would you do that? Amen. And we appreciate them bringing their instruments and they've got to pack them up. And we gotta, we're got we going to work on putting the place on the platform over here where they can store their instruments and not have to find a place or take them home. You know, that's a lot of work. So the baptistry, uh, we want to we wanna be able to view baptistries coming up in the future. And we thank God for souls that are being saved. It's all about souls, right? Amen. And so we want to re-fiberglass the baptistry. That's something we're working on the back two houses to paint. The fence, uh, the yellow wall and yellow garage siding down here, uh, prep and repaint fence, patch parking lot. Now, here's another miracle. The parking lot cracks. We want to slurry seal that probably around June. Already, a P our PE team has come together, and they've already donated the money and pledged the money to repaint and restripe all the parking lot lines on the whole church parking lot. So that money is, is, is already pledged. When the time is right, we're going to collect that. But before we do that, we want to fix all the cracks. How many notice some cracks in the blacktop? We want to fix all the cracks and slurry seal it so it's nice and clean. Then we're going to stripe it. Okay, so we've, we've had a business friend come and let us know that they will donate all the labor to slurry seal the parking lot. All we need to do is buy the materials for $3,200. That's like a $9,000 job. We just got to buy the materials. And so that's being lined up already. So God is helping us in a big, big way. And so also we want to purchase and install new black lights on the exterior of the church. When we painted the outside, all the lights were taken off and they were old. And so we want to get new ones. And so that's going to be really, really nice. And then on the black carpet, just for now, for the 40th, we can't do new carpet yet. That's going to be for the remodel of the inside of the sanctuary. But we, at least we want to stretch it and tack it down. And then we have some missing ceiling tiles up here. Anyone notice these? We want to get new tiles and paint them black. And, uh, and then we want to patch holes on the upper pop-outs. You see them right here? See those holes up there? And those up there, we don't want our guests coming for the 40th and thinking what, what's going on there. Amen. So anyways, that's an update. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? God is doing great things. Thank you for giving. Thank you for supporting. We can do this as a family of God united because we love our church. Somebody say, I love my church. Amen. God bless you. Would you stand with me? We are going to go to God in prayer for the offering.
And we thank you for your faithfulness in giving, not only in your worship, but in tithe and offering unto the Lord. And we want to pray that God will bless you and your household and your family greatly. Praise God. Let's pray. Lord God, we love you. We thank you, God, for blessing us abundantly. We thank you, God, for shining upon us, Lord. You are already doing amazing things, and we thank you for it, God. We pray that you'll continue to bless your people as we stand faithfully in your presence, Lord. As we give in our worship, as we give in our tithe and offering and kingdom builder, Lord. As we put you first because we love our church. I'm asking God that you would in return continuously bless every household, prosper every household and their family, their children. In the name of Jesus, we ask and pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Now as we, uh, four ways to give right here, you'll see them on the screen. We'd like for everybody to come down and touch the baskets. We realize that many of you give online. So you may not have an envelope in your hand or cash in your hand or a check in your hand because you gave online. But as, as an action of worship, would you join the South Bay family and everybody come down and touch the basket. Amen. Let's do that together and let's worship the Lord in our giving. God bless you. been noticing that's been happening in, in, in our church is that we've been dancing a little bit more. Just a little bit. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing wrong with it. And you know, quite quite frankly, quite frankly, I really enjoy when the church gets together and they just lose themselves in worship. Sometimes I feel like we come to church and we, we you know, expect a structure and, and although that's put in place and it's good and it's needed at times, sometimes it's, what's needed is just a little praise break, a time to just lose yourself, maybe undo your tie for the guys who are wearing ties, maybe take a couple bobby pins out for the ladies who have couple. If you have more than that, then just leave your hair. It'll probably be there's the remainder of, of the service taking them out. But I want to know how many of you guys have a dance in you this morning? How many of you got a praise in you this morning? See, in the beginning of the service, I said, how many of you are thankful just to wake up this morning? See, a lot of times we, we, we would like to think of something so huge, something so big, something so grand to be like, this is why I'm glad, and this is why I'm dancing, but it could be just as simple as, God, you woke me up this morning, so I'm going to give you the praise. 
I, I, I woke up this morning and, and, and I'm not in pain anymore, so I, I'm going to give you some praise. I, I woke up this morning and it's a Sunday and, and I get to come into the house of the Lord with my brothers and my sisters and worship you today. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough to praise him. That's enough to worship him. That's enough. Hallelujah. I have another question. If God stopped doing things in your life, would you have a reason to still praise him? I know I would. I know I would have a reason to still praise him. Why? Because he forgave me of all my sins. When I went down in that watery grave and came up, baptized in Jesus' name, that moment, if God decided to not do anything else in my life, that is enough for me to continue praising him for the rest of my life. So again, how many of you have a praise inside of you that you just got to let out in this place? Hallelujah. praise inside of me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet nobody can stop me from giving the praise so come on and help me in praising his name i got a praise inside of me from the top of my head to the sole of my feet nobody can stop me from giving the praise so just come on and help me in praising his name Sometimes I look out, and I'm not saying here, but sometimes some people look like God hasn't been good to them. And again, I'm not saying it's here, but, you know, if God truly has been good to you, if he saved you from a life of sin, if he's ever touched your body, if he's ever done anything for you, if he's ever saved a, an unsaved, lost loved one, Come on, those are some reasons to just be like, God, you've been good. And you know what another reason could be? Is that he touched the person next to you. He may not be doing anything in your life right now, but if you see your neighbor and God's got a hold of them and they're losing themselves in worship, or you know of a testimony of someone, if you would know the testimony of Brother Jerome, then you would know that God's been
second. I want you to find a praise partner. It could be one other person. It could be two other people. But I want you to find someone next to you. And I want you to link arms with them. I want you to link arms with them. And without even asking, I just want you to start dancing with them. I just want you to start moving with them. I want you to start glorifying God with them. And the more you do that, I'm going to tell you something. Once you start moving and they start going with you, God's going to begin to do something with you guys. The Holy Spirit is going to move upon you like it hasn't before. But here's the thing. you got to make up in your mind that you want to completely lose yourself in worship. you got to make up in your mind that you have a praise that you got to let out. you got to make up in your mind that if this is the way that I have to get my healing, if this is the way that I have to get my breakthrough, then I'm going to do it. I'm going to dance. Oh. I'm going to dance until breakthrough happens. I'm going to dance until healing hits my body. I'm going to dance.
gonna give you, I'm gonna give you 30 more seconds. I'm gonna give you 30 more seconds to lose your mind just a little bit. And just to give God all that you have. the church to listen to what's going on around you right now.
entered into his gates with thanksgiving. We've entered into his courts with praise. We are now positioned to receive from the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What would you have me do, Lord? Here am I. Here am I. What would you have me do? Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I invite you to stand with us for the reading of God's Word. I want to add my welcome to the Wells from Michigan. Bless you, folks. We love you. We're so honored to have you with us here tonight. And they only came out for just four days. And I don't think this time it was totally to escape the weather because I was just in Minnesota all last week and they were having like San Diego weather almost there. But great grandson, Caleb. Final 
reference. I don't normally read this much in our opening text, but I am today. Matthew 16, starting in verse 1, three verses here. The Pharisees also, this is where my message title will come from. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting, desired Jesus that he would show them a sign from heaven. Jesus answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? And with God's help, I'm going to preach this morning. What's the difference in preaching and teaching? Well, maybe several things you can point out, but I'll tell you what the difference will be today. Preaching is fast and teaching is slow. So I'm going to ramp it up. I'm going to be preaching fast. I'm going to get into high gear and high speed right off the bat because I've got so much to share in a very limited amount of time. If you don't catch it all, I want to speak to your spirit as much as anything. And you can go back later and embed it in your mind and your, your heart, the tables of your heart. But with God's help this morning, I'm going to preach what the Lord laid in my heart for today. Pursue prophetic discernment. Pursue prophetic discernment. God, I thank you for gracing us with your presence. We are so undeserving, but let us never be ungrateful. We are thankful that we can just feel you, God. <laughs> thank you that I can feel you, that I can know every time I come to your house, I can feel your spirit, your presence, your nearness, your love. Thank you, God. Let me never take that for granted. And now I pray, Lord, to the praise and the worship and the prayer and the adoration and the exaltation and all of this, God, that we've done before your throne room now, sitting in heavenly places, I pray that our hearts are prepared, God, to be fertile soil that's a seed of your eternal truth may be planted, embedded deep into our lives, God, to make an ever-living change. We ask, Lord, that we not be hearers only today of your word, but that we be doers. In Jesus' name we pray it. And everyone said amen. Amen. Join me in giving the Lord one more expression of adoration. Praise God. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. God, you're worthy, Lord. Oh, God, you're worthy. I pray you will increase to fill the whole earth, God. We must decrease. You must increase. That happens today. Your precious name. Praise the Lord God. You may be seated, God. Richly, richly bless you. Amen. Pursue prophetic discernment. In the year 2017, three significant and unusual events occurred in America. First of all, on August 21, 2017, a notable event. The great American, it was labeled solar eclipse. It was a very rare solar eclipse because this one was visible across the nation from the West Coast to the East Coast. And on September 23rd, 2017, another exceptionally rare event of an alignment of stars and constellations occurred. The nine stars of the zodiac constellation Leo plus three planets, Mercury, Venus, and Mars, appeared at the head of Virgo, which aligned in a unique way with the moon, with Jupiter, and with the sun, resembling the depiction of Revelation 12 in the Bible, where in verse 1 it says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, which is exactly what was portrayed in the skies, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Reportedly, the alignment of this nature had only occurred twice in all history. These constellations will be in significant alignment again during the solar eclipse of this year, 2024, seven years later. Revelation 12 warns of a conflict between the Antichrist, also called the beast in Scripture, and the saints as well as foretelling the rebirth of Israel and Jerusalem as a nation. And in fact, when the book of Revelation describes the Antichrist warring against the saints, it's not talking about the church saints, they're gone. It's talking about the Israeli saints. 
the rebirth of Israel and Jerusalem as a nation, and God again turning his attention to his chosen people. Israel was reborn on May, on, in May of 1948, 75 years ago, coming up on 76 years in May. The third significant event I want to point out in 2017 happened on December the 6th, when the United States officially named Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. There was an amazing speech given by then-President Trump. I'm going to read this speech quickly. I think it's noteworthy. Thank you. When I came into office, I promised to look at the words, world's challenges with open eyes and a very fresh thinking. We cannot solve our problems by making the same failed assumptions and repeating the same failed strategies of the past. Old challenges demand new approaches. My announcement today marks the beginning of a new approach to conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. In 1995, Congress adopted the Jew Jerusalem Embassy Act, urging the federal government to relocate the American embassy to Jerusalem and to recognize that that city, and so importantly, is Israel's capital. This act passed Congress by an overwhelming bipartisan majority and was reaffirmed by a unanimous vote of the Senate only six months ago. Yet for over 20 years, every previous American president has exercised the law's waiver refusing to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem or to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital city. Presidents issued these waivers under the belief that delaying the recognition of Jerusalem would advance the cause of peace. Some say they lacked courage, but they made their best judgments based on the facts as they understood them at the time. Nevertheless, the record is in. After more than two decades of waivers, we are no closer to lasting peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. It would be folly to assume that repeating the exact same formula would now produce a different or better result. Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. While previous presidents have made this a major campaign promise, they failed to deliver. Today, I am delivering. I've judged this course of action to be in the best interests of the United States of America and the pursuit of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. This is a long overdue step to advance the peace process and to work towards a lasting agreement. Israel is a sovereign nation with the right, like every other sovereign nation, to determine its own capital. Acknowledging this as a fact is a necessary condition for achieving peace. It was 70 years ago that the United States under President Truman recognized the state of Israel. Ever since then, Israel has made its capital in the city of Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish people established in ancient times. Today, Jerusalem is the seat of the modern Israeli government. It is the home of the Israeli parliament, the Knesset, as well as the Israeli Supreme Court. It is the location of the official residence of the Prime Minister and the President. It is the headquarters of many government ministries. For decades, visiting American presidents, secretaries of state, military leaders have met their Israeli counterparts in Jerusalem, as I did on my trip to Israel earlier this year. Jerusalem is not just the heart of three great religions, but it is now also the heart of one of the most successful democracies in the world. Over the past seven decades, the Israeli people have built a country where Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and people of all faiths are free to live and worship according to their conscience and according to their beliefs. Jerusalem is today and must remain a place where Jews pray at the Western Wall, where Christians walk the Stations of the Cross, and where Muslims worship at Al-Aqsa Mosque. However, through all these years, presidents representing the United States have declined to officially recognize Jerusalem is Israel's capital. In fact, we have declined to acknowledge any Israeli capital at all. But today, we finally acknowledge the obvious, that Jerusalem is Israel's capital. This is nothing more or less than a recognition of reality. It is also the right thing to do. It's something that has to be done. That is why, consistent with the Jewish Embassy Act, I am also directing the State Department to begin preparation to move the American Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. This will immediately begin the process of hiring architects, engineers, and planners so that a new embassy, when completed, will be a magnificent tribute to peace. In making these announcement, announcements, I also want to make one point very clear. This decision is not intended in any way to reflect a departure from our strong commitment to facilitate a lasting peace agreement. We want an agreement that is a good deal for the Israelis and a great deal for the Palestinians. A great deal for Israelis and Palestinians. We are not taking a position of any final status issues, including the specific boundaries of the Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem or the resolution of contested borders. Those questions are up to the parties involved. The United States remains deeply committed to helping facilitate a peace agreement 
that is acceptable to both sides. I intend to do everything in my power to help forge such an agreement. Without question, Jerusalem is one of the most sensitive issues in those talks. The United States would support a two-state solution if agreed to by both sides. In the meantime, I call on all parties to maintain the status quo on Jerusalem's holy sites, including the Temple Mount, also known as Haram al-Sharif. Above all, our greatest hope is for peace, the universal yearning in every human soul. With today's action, I reaffirm my administration's longstanding commitment to a future of peace and security for the region. There will, of course, be disagreement and dissent regarding this announcement. But we are confident that ultimately, as we work through these disagreements, we will arrive at a peace and a place for greater understanding and cooperation. This sacred city should call forth the best in humanity, lifting our sights to what is possible, not pulling us back and down to the old fights that have become so totally predictable. Peace is never beyond the grasp of those willing to reach. So today, we call for calm, for moderation, and for the voices of tolerance to prevail over the purveyors of hate. Our children should inherit our love, not our conflicts. I repeat the message I delivered at the historic and extraordinary summit in Saudi Arabia earlier this year. The Middle East is a region rich with culture, spirit, and history. Its people are brilliant, proud, and diverse, vibrant, and strong. But the incredible future awaiting this region is held at bay by bloodshed, ignorance, and terror. Vice President Pence will travel to the region in the coming days to reaffirm our commitment to work with the partners throughout the Middle East to defeat radicalism that threatens the hopes and dreams of future generations. It is time for the many who desire peace to expel the extremists from their midst. It is time for all civilized nations and people to respond to disagreement with reasoned debate, not violence. And it is time for young and moderate voices all across the Middle East to claim for themselves a bright and beautiful future. So today, let us rededicate ourselves to a path of mutual understanding and respect. Let us rethink old assumptions and open our hearts and minds to possible and possibilities. And finally, I ask the leaders of this region, political and religious, Israeli and Palestinian, Jewish and Christian and Muslim, to join us in the noble quest for lasting peace. Thank you. God bless you. God bless Israel. God bless the Palestinians. God bless the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. This proclamation signed by, at the time, President Donald Trump. That is important because right now, as we know, we've come full circle again, and the focus is on peace in the Mideast. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 2 says, The Lord, thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. For the heathen are dismayed at them. The birth of Jesus Christ himself was announced by a special star in heaven's sky. And Herod was dismayed at that sign. In Matthew 2, 1 and 2, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And Herod was troubled and dismayed at this. This fulfilled an amazing prophecy way back, way back in the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall arise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. In Matthew 16, verse 1, the Pharisees also, with the Sadducees, came and tempting Jesus, desired he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said, when it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky's red. In the morning, it's foul weather today, for the sky's red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? I'm preaching about pursuing prophetic discernment. The story of Jesus' virgin birth, his life, his ministry, his miracles, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, all of these constitute the gospel. Jesus finally was received up into heaven in a cloud with the promise that he's going to return in like manner. The most prolifically prophetic gospel chapter in the whole Bible is found in Matthew chapter 24. 
And it says in verse 39, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven like he went away with power and great glory. That is not a description of the rapture where only the redeemed, those who are waiting and watching and loving his appearing, will see him when he comes like a thief in the night. The rapture has already occurred prior to verse 29 and 30 of Matthew 24. This is the part of his second coming where he comes all the way down to earth. The next verse, verse 31 says, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together the elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to other. So the church is already in heaven at this point. You see, this is when he comes back for his saints or with his saints. He first comes back for his saints who are caught up to meet him in the air. Then he comes back with his saints all the way back to earth. And when his foot touches down on the Mount of Olives, where he last prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane and was arrested on the night beginning his passion before being falsely accused, abused, tortured, and finally executed on the cross of Calvary. But this time when he returns and his foot touches down on the Mount of Olives, it will split in half. Jesus said there will be signs in the sky and there will be signs on the earth. Farmers, you look to the sky. We are admonished as children of God. In Luke 21, 28, when you see all these things begin to come to pass, not once they have passed, but you see the beginning of these sorrows, then you look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. I'm preaching today that we are seeing the beginning signs of the end times and the sorrows of the earth. It's time to look up and lift up your head. Your redemption draweth nigh. Let's give him a praise for that promise. Thank you, God. Signs in the moon, signs in the sun. Joel 2, 31, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great, and terrible day of the Lord come. In Acts 2, verse 20, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. A direct quotation from Joel's prophecy, fittingly so, because Acts 2 is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy of God in the last days, pouring out of His Spirit upon all flesh. I... Notice notice here, there have been four blood moons in each of 1948 to 49, 1967 to 68, and again in, in 2014 and 15, there are four blood moons within these Jewish years. A blood red moon is a lunar eclipse. Now note the Jews use the lunar calendar. We use the solar calendar. So in Jewish tradition, signs in the moon are for Jews, warnings, etc. Signs in the sun are for Gentiles. In 1948, Israel became a nation. And immediately following that, in 1949 and 50, there were four lunar eclipses, each one of them on Jewish holy days. In 1967, there was the Six-Day War where Israel regained all of Jerusalem as her capital. And immediately following that, in 1967 and 1968, there were four blood moons, all on Jewish holy days. In 2014, there were three blood moons and one total solar Eclipse. Remember, that's a sign for the Gentiles in Jewish tradition. All of them on Jewish holy days. And in September of 2015, there was a fourth blood moon during the Feast 
of tabernacles. And this particular one was a supermoon, and that's the picture on the screen, which means the moon is at its closest point to the earth ever, resulting in it looking like it's hanging over Jerusalem, so close you can touch it, in a massive red ball called a blood moon. That one coincided with the Jewish feast of tabernacles. So when the Bible says the sun will not give her light and the moon will be turned to blood, we see the signs of that happening. How often does that happen? Before 1949, when Israel was recognized again as a nation the year before, 1948, before 1949, it had not happened for 500 years. So what God is doing, he's hanging an advertisement in the heavens, bigger than any screen you could ever imagine. And he's saying, wake up, wake up, wake up. I'm doing something noteworthy here. You need to be awake. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verses 32 to 34, now learn a parable of the fig tree, where his branch is yet, when his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves. You know, summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you see all these things he's talking about, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. What generation was he talking about? He was talking about the generation that would be like the fig tree that put forth her leaves knowing that summer is nigh. He was talking about the rebirth of Israel as a nation. When he gave this promise, Israel was not recognized as a sovereign nation. They were under Roman rule. And they would not be recognized for another 2,000 years going forward until 1948. That's the generation he was talking about. So if you were born in 1948, there is a good hope that you will be alive when the rapture occurs. Because he said, that generation shall not pass until all this is fulfilled. Referring to an old prophecy that Israel would be born as a nation in one day. That's in Isaiah 66, verse 8. What is it that a nation should be born in a day? Israel was, dest was destroyed after they put Christ to death. In 70 A.D., Roman Titus and the people were scattered all over the world. But in 1929, 19 years before Israel reborn as a nation, 1948, an old preacher wrote a song. I'm going to get some help here. Sister Nita Hodge is going to help me on the keys, and some singers are going to come with her. I think my wife and Sister Nobbs and, and maybe Sister Lake. I'm not sure who all is going to help with this. They're going to come forward. And, and, and they're going to sing this song that this preacher wrote. I want to read the lyrics just before they sing it. The song is entitled, It's All in Him, written in 1929. Listen, 19 years before Israel became, was reborn as a nation. Here's the lyrics. The mighty God is Jesus, the Prince of Peace is He. The everlasting Father, the King eternally. The wonderful in wisdom by whom all things were made. The fullness of the Godhead in Jesus is displayed. The chorus says it's all in Him, it's all in Him. The fullness of the Godhead, it's all in Him. It's all in Him, it's all in Him. The mighty God is Jesus, it's all in Him. He goes on to say, Emmanuel, God with us, Jehovah, Lord of hosts. The omnipresent Spirit who fills the universe. The advocate, the high priest, the lamb for sinners slain. The author of redemption, O glory to his name, the Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, the living word incarnate, the helpless sinner's friend, our wisdom and perfection, our righteousness and power. Yes, all we need in Jesus we find this very hour. Listen to this last verse, prophetic verse, 19 years before Israel had been reborn, 2,000 years, not a sovereign nation. But here's what this old preacher wrote. He said, our God for whom we've waited will be the glad refrain of Israel recreated when Jesus comes again. Lo, 
He will come and save us, our King and Priest to be. For in Him dwells all fullness. The Lord of all is He. Would you stand and worship as they sing this old song? seated. All that old preacher had to go on was the prophecies of the Bible. This was written 19 years before Israel became a nation. When he wrote this song, it was a hopeless situation for Israel. Lenin, Marx, and Stalin had already killed 12 million Jews. 12 million Jews. Think of that. And this is before Hitler would kill 6 million more Jews. 18 million Jews were exterminated when he wrote this song. It looked like anything but Israel recreated. But he held on to an ancient promise 
thousands of years old, that Israel would be recreated and reborn as a nation in a day. The Holocaust. By the way, Jews started leaving Israel in the tens and hundreds of thousands. No one wanted them. One group was rejected here from America and traveled all the way down the East Coast, all the way to Cuba. The Holocaust, with its six million unanswered prayers, finally got the attention of the world. And the United Nations decided to do something in a committee meeting talking about this the last week of August 1947. They said the only reasonable thing to do was to parcel out a piece of land in the Middle East in Palestine, so named by the Romans, by the way, so that the Jews would have somewhere to go. Of course, all this was fulfillment of prophecy that God would regather Israel. I preached a message on March 5th, 2017, maybe it's in the archive somewhere, entitled Israel, God's Stopwatch. And in that message, I gave you four facts that are unique only to Israel. Number one, Israel is the only nation on earth created by God. That's in Genesis 12. Number two, Israel is the only nation in everlasting covenant with God. That's in Genesis 17. Number three, Israel is both the land and Israel is a people. And God said both of them, the land and the people, belong to me. And number four, Israel and the Jews have blessed the world more than any nation on earth. Fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise. God said, I will bless you, I will make you a blessing, and all who bless you will be blessed, and all who curse you will be cursed, which is why I wear this American-Israeli flag pin nearly everywhere I go in public, and every time I do an interview, and this started back in 2020, I get asked by reporters and others all the time, why do you wear that? It gives me an opportunity to witness to them. There's only two hopes for America as I see it. Number one, that America turn back to God. That's my number one endeavor. That's why I'm a preacher and not a politician. That's the number one hope, turn America back to God. But the number two hope is a political hope, and that is that America always remains the friend to Israel because she has an everlasting covenant. Whoever blesses Israel will be blessed, but whoever curses Israel will be cursed. We need to pray that America never abandons Israel. Vote for politicians, amen, that will make sure we don't abandon Israel. In the meantime, we're trying to reach every soul and turn America's heart back to God. Praise God. Amen. Also, not only that has America blessed every blessed the world more than any other nation, but there are three of the most important gifts Israel has given to the world. Number one, Israel gave us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. How can anyone who calls himself Christian be anti-Semitic, which means to hate the Jews, when our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was born in flesh as a Jew? Number two, Israel gave us the most important book in the world. And every word of this holy Bible was written by a Jew. It's a 100% Jewish book that gives us the light today to daily live our lives by. And number three, Israel gave us the church, which was all Jews in the beginning. All the way up until Acts 10, it was all Jews. And then the door was open for the rest of us. So Israel gave us the most important man in human history, gave us the most important book in human history, and gave us the most important institution in all human history. Jerusalem became the city of David and the capital of the United Kingdom of Israel. You need to know this, especially today with a narrative that's floating out there that's a false narrative. Jerusalem became the city of David and the capital of the United Kingdom of Israel in 1000 B.C., before Christ. After rejecting Jesus as their Messiah, Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 A.D., and the Jews scattered and dispersed amongst the nations of the world. Meantime, the Muslims moved in and built a mosque. You'll see a picture of that. It's the gold dome there on the left side of the picture above the group. I think, I forget which year this is, either our 2018 group or maybe it's our 2022 group. But anyway, all of our groups have gone there five times. The Muslims moved in and they built a mosque. That's that gold dome in the background on the Jewish Temple Mount. Listen, they built that more than 600 years after Christ's death in the late 7th century. That's more than 1,600 years after Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. So those claiming today 
that the Jews took that land of Israel from the Muslims, that is a false report. In fact, the Muslims did not even exist at the time of Christ. They did not exist until after, sometime after Christ. The Bible's prophecy that the man-child will be delivered amongst great tribulation is spoken of in Revelation 15.1. And the man-child, by the way, is the Jews. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Within one generation, or at least before that generation passes, that saw the birth of Israel in one day, the rapture may take place at any time. Here's what Jesus said about his soon return in Matthew 24, 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in, as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field, one taken, the other left. Two women shall be at Starbucks. The one, oh, I'm sorry, that's the modern version. Grinding at the mill, grinding coffee beans. The one taken, the other left. Watch therefore, you know not what hour your Lord doth come. You know he will come in an hour. He won't give you a day's advance warning. He will come in an hour, and you don't know that hour, but he will come. Noah's family was in the ark seven days before the rains fell and the flood rose. And Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, he's going to take his church to a safe place before his wrath falls on the earth. In Luke 21, 9, but when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not by and by. Then said he unto them, nations shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines and pestilences and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven, verse 12. But before all these, before all these, before all these, so no preterism here, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the, into the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. We'll be brought before kings and rulers for Jesus' name's sake. Did you get that? There'll be persecution, but it brings us before kings, amen, and rulers for his name's sake. We've got to keep the faith once delivered to the saints. Hallelujah. Something else unusual happened in 2017. I mentioned that first solar eclipse. It was the first total solar eclipse in America that traversed America in more than 100 years, and that's what made it so unusual traversing America. Again, Lunar signs for Jews, solar signs for Gentiles one month earlier in August. Note the path that's going to come on the screen here, that solar eclipse in 2017 across America. And again, that's when the moon completely blocks the sun, causing the earth to be temporarily in, in absolute darkness. And, and, and it was last visible across the United States, August 21, 2017. It moved from the northwest to the southeast. My wife and I were driving in Tennessee at the time, and I took this picture, solar eclipse, August 21st, expect heavy traffic. You say, yeah, preacher, but we've always had solar eclipses. Well, it's a big deal because one had not been visible at all from the continent of the United States in 37 years, and one had not passed over the country in almost 100 years. And so for many, that eclipse was a once-in-a-lifetime event. Now listen, the next solar eclipse after 2017 will take place April this year. April 2024 will be the next total solar eclipse traversing the United States April this year, the same year as our general conference being here in Southern California, the first time back in California in 40 years. And unlike the eclipse in 2017 that ran from the northwest to the southeast, this one, seven years later, April 2024, will run from the southwest to the northeast. When superimposed on the picture of 2017, it forms an X, as this picture will show you, across the United States. Is God crossing out the United States? I don't know. I don't know. But I'll tell you one thing noteworthy. That X marks the crossing of two solar eclipses. 
And in conjunction of those two paths, right where they both traverse one another, cross one another, right in that crossing, that conjunction, that is exactly where the headquarters of the United Pentecostal Church International lies near St. Louis, Missouri. Think about that. The next total solar eclipse is next month, and it will cross the path, forming next at the exact point of St. Louis. Is it a mere coincidence that the world headquarters of the largest oneness, apostolic, Pentecostal, holiness movement in the world is headquartered right there in the crossing of that X? It's interesting. According to NASA, the first point of contact in 2017 in the continental United States was at Lincoln Beach in Oregon at precisely 9.05 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time with totality beginning at 10.16 a.m., which was the exact moment that sunset began in Israel Monday evening that same day at 7.16 p.m. What are the odds of that? At the same time, America went dark supernaturally. Israel went dark naturally. Both America and Israel went dark at exactly the same minute. Is that a coincidence? You decide. The first major city in Oregon to experience a total solar eclipse was Salem, which is named after Jerusalem. The path of totality across America passed through 12 states. There are 12 tribes of Israel. Remember Jesus said in Luke 21, 25, there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and signs on earth. And what do we have here? We have solar eclipses, lunar eclipses, the Revelation 12 sign in the heavens, the great woman in heaven clothed with the sun and moon under her feet and on her head, a crown of 12 stars. It's interesting also that Hollywood would release their new American Wonder Woman movie in 2017 coinciding with the exact same dates as the solar eclipse that crossed America. And that right in the middle of 2017, in that first total solar eclipse, here we are right in the middle of 2017 to 2024, the second solar eclipse was the year 2020, right in the middle of these two solar eclipses, an unprecedented year when COVID became the new reset button. And we saw people in the United States and around the world acquiescing to governments, stripping liberties from individuals and everyone in the name of health, safety, and welfare. Even encouraging the reporting of businesses and fellow citizens who were not in compliance with their government, turning neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother, sister against sister, trampling not only our personal liberties, but our religious liberties, which is the first mentioned in the Constitution's Bill of Rights, I'd argue, upon which all other rights hinge, including free speech, press, assembly, petition of the government for redress of grievances. Churches were ordered by the government for the first time in our nation's history to close completely or be severely restricted every major holiday weekend. Every, by the way, holiday comes originally from the word holy day. Holy day. And every major holiday weekend that would normally have record crowds in churches, churches were ordered closed completely in California for most of those and severely restricted for the rest, starting with Easter Sunday, closed for the first time, Mother's Day, Father's Day, July 4th weekend, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. And it was not until we received our first favorable United States Supreme Court ruling February 5 and April 26 did we get relief in California and around America. But that all happened in this juxtaposition of these two great solar eclipses, 2017, 2024, right in the middle in the year 2020. I was researching for this message, and just yesterday I was shocked. I was looking up some information on the red heifer, and I found a, a couple of reports by CBS National News. I watched one of them. It was five minutes long, and I was shocked right towards, right, right, right in the middle of that report, all of a sudden, I appeared in the CBS News. It startled me. I'm going to show you that clip here. It comes at about the four-minute mark. The conflict in Gaza now entering its sixth month. The Israeli operation to root out Hamas terrorists there has resulted in the deaths of 30,000 Palestinians and 242 Israeli soldiers. The war started after Hamas attacked Israel on October 7th. 
killing almost 1,200 people and taking nearly 230 hostage, some still in captivity. Despite the deadly outcome across the region, one trigger for the Hamas rampage has been widely overlooked. Chris Livesay has the story from Jerusalem. The infamous October 7 massacre that sparked a war. But one confounding yet eye-opening motive has escaped the headlines. In a recent speech, a Hamas spokesman blamed the Jews for bringing red cows to the Holy Land. The cows he's talking about at a secure, undisclosed location are these, red heifers to be precise. Some Jews and Christians believe they're the key to rebuilding the historic Jewish temple in Jerusalem and to beckoning the Messiah. To understand, you have to go back nearly 2,000 years when the ancient Romans destroyed the last temple in the city. To rebuild it, these believers point to the Bible's Book of Numbers. It commands the Israelites to sacrifice a red heifer without defect or blemish, and that has never been under a yoke. Only then can the temple rise again. Caring for them on an Israeli settlement in the West Bank is Yitzhak Mamo. So we have here, uh, after a long research, we find in uh, Texas, in Texas. Uh, yeah, yeah, Texas, United States of America. Texas Red Angus, flying them 7,000 miles to Israel. This is not a publicity stunt. W what do you mean? Meaning, this is something you take very seriously. Harry Potter is a good story. The Bible is not story. The Bible is a way of God to lead us. A massive altar already awaits where the heifers are to be burned. According to some believers, the ceremony needs to be performed right here on the Mount of Olives, looking directly into where the temple once stood. But something else now stands in its place. The Dome of the Rock and Al-Aqsa Mosque, among the holiest sites in Islam. Today, only Muslims are allowed inside, but that's not stopping Jewish activists outside. Once you got, you started here. Six days a week, Melissa Jane Kronfeld leads groups from around the world who defiantly pray, as close as armed guards permit. It's not about the destruction of Islamic holy sites. It's about preserving this place and being guardians over the house of God for all people. So you're happy with it where it is? No, it's going to go 100%, but I believe it's going it, to go. It's 100%, yeah. The whole thing is going to go is to build a temple. When you say that Dome of the Rock has to go, mm -hmm. MJ, it's hard for me to imagine something more incendiary. Let me ask you something. The Middle East seems pretty destabilized right now, and the war, if I'm not mistaken, is already here. To be clear, hers is a dream not shared by the Israeli government or by the vast majority of Israelis and Jews. But it's been enough to incite numerous Islamist groups. Hamas has dubbed its October 7 assault on Israel the Al-Aqsa wave and has the Dome of the Rock on its emblem. But this is sacred ground to billions of Muslims globally, not just Hamas terrorists, stresses Imam Mustafa Abu Sway of Al-Aqsa Mosque. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims. So you'll find reaction from Indonesia to Toronto to New York. That's really given. Al-Aqsa Mosque belongs to all Muslims, and the Muslims today are 2 billion people. Two billion people. Simply by performing these acts, are, are these Jewish activists kicking a hornet's nest? They are. They are. A hornet's nest they're kicking all the way to Capitol Hill. So good to see you here in the nation's capital. Those sacred cows were showcased in Washington at a recent is. prayer gathering. Many evangelicals believe these red heifers will usher Christ's second coming. We need the Messiah to come, right? So for me, the red heifer is red for the blood of Jesus Christ. Back in the West Bank, Mamo says the ceremony could take place any day. But can you understand why Hamas could be outraged by something like this. I cannot understand that even if they are right, why they have to slot and uh, rape people to win their war. Terrorists have been attacking us before we ever dreamed of these cows, he reflects. They don't need them as an excuse to kill. For CBS Saturday Morning, Chris Livesay, Jerusalem. So be careful. You never know when you're on camera. Warning. Warning to everybody. <laughs>
Hallelujah. This year, 2024, our district will host the General Conference of the United Pentecost Church International, first time in 40 years. And on October 4, Friday night, soon you'll see the promotions coming forth. Again, thank you for your prayers. And, and uh, the week before last at General Executive Board meetings, we were approved to turn Friday night into a Revive America spiritual awakening, an encounter with signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost. To our surprise, we found out that 20 miles north of Azusa Street, 40 miles north from where we'll be holding General Conference, which is 20 miles south of Azusa Street, there'll be competing World Conference led by John MacArthur called the Cessationist Conference. And they'll be trying to show from Scripture that all signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost died when the apostles died. Well, I would have to say, sorry, you came too late to tell us that. <laughs> We're experiencing those signs, wonders, miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost every single week, every day somewhere in the world. Praise God. But also taking place on that Friday night, this is so very, very noteworthy. On that same Friday night at sundown, it will mark the end of the Jewish Rosh Hashanah, and it will mark the beginning of a new year. But this will be a new year like any other new year. On that Friday sundown, on October 4, 2024, all around the world, wherever Jews are, they will be blowing the ram's horns, the shofars, and they will be announcing the 70th Jubilee of Israel. This has never occurred. What does that mean? 3,500 years ago, 3,500 years ago, when Joshua finally, after 40 years wandering in the wilderness with Moses, led the children of Israel into their promised land, God said, for 49 years, you will work the land and eat the profits and the fruits of it. But every 50th year, you must let the land be at rest. And every contract is fulfilled. Every debt is forgiven. Everything goes back to its rightful owner. If there are slaves, they are released to independence and freedom of life. Everything is restored. Every 50 years, you will have a year of jubilee. They have done that 69 times. October 4, Friday night of our general conference at sundown, they will be blowing the shofar and celebrating and announcing, now we celebrate the 70th Jubilee of Israel. Hallelujah. Amen. I close with this. In my favorite book and chapter of the Bible, Acts chapter 2, it says in verse 19, And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon shall be turned into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord. The heavenly signs and the earthly signs are occurring in the same year, 2024. In Acts 2, 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be Saved. That is a direct reference to calling on the name of the Lord in baptism. Peter cites the prophet Joel speaking about pouring of the Holy Ghost in Joel 2. In the last days, God will pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. And when Peter preaches a sermon in Acts 2, and they ask him the most important question any human being could ever ask God or a man of God, what shall I do pertaining to my sins, pertaining to my life, pertaining to my future, pertaining to eternity. What shall I do? Peter answered, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That is still the answer. I'm preaching today to admonish you, to encourage you, to motivate you, to make sure of your salvation. Every sign yet to be fulfilled before the coming of the Lord to catch his church, his bride, out of the world. All those signs have already come to pass. All those prophecies have already happened. There's not one thing remaining preventing the coming of the Lord. He could come right now. He could come at the close of this message. He could come at the close of this day. Nothing prevents him from returning. Every day you must live as if he may come in any given hour of that day. He's coming very, very soon. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. Psalm 34 and 3 says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. 
Let us exalt his name together. I'm going to give you, as you're standing, the greatest sign of the end times. According to Jesus Christ himself, these are his words in Matthew 16, 4. He said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it. What's he saying? He's saying, you've had all the signs you need. <laughs> he said, you can look at the sky and tell what the weather is. Can't you tell where we are living right now in the timeline of human history? I'm not giving you any more signs. You don't need another sign to give it to you. He said, here's the last convincing sign. This is Matthew 16, 4. The sign of the prophet Jonas. He's talking about Jonah. What sign did Jonah give to the people of Nineveh? Did he show something miraculous in the heavens? Did he show something unexplainable on earth? No. The only sign Jonah gave the people of Nineveh of the impending destruction of their city if they did not turn back to God immediately he only gave them the sign of God's word preaching is the last and greatest sign God has given to this generation to let them know he's wrapping things up he's about to end this thing as we know it life as we know it and the world as we know it is about to conclude. Let me tell you, the greatest sermon you'll ever hear will be your last sermon. But you don't know which one that is. For someone, it may well be this sermon. We do not know. But I promise you, if you don't respond, if you don't turn your heart to God, if you're not born again, and if you don't walk with Him in holiness until He comes, waiting and loving His appearing, you will end up in a fiery hell with the devil and his deceiving imps. But your mind will be lucid. Your mind will be a recorder running again and again in your head. I'll never forget a reporter of a major network that interviewed me in 2020. And he came back to meet me again and wanted to privately meet and counsel with him and advise him and pray with him. And he said, you said some words I can't get out of my mind. It's like a recorder running over and over and over. I'm telling you, that's going to happen in eternity. In hell, you're going to remember word for word the last sermon you ever heard on earth. Hallelujah. And if you're in heaven, you're going to be grateful you had a pastor who preached the truth regardless of the consequences. I'm not trying to win you as a friend. I'm trying to win you to heaven as a child of God. I'm trying to help you get your soul saved forever. Hallelujah. Public opinion won't matter in heaven or in hell. Neither will polls, neither will equity, neither will equality, neither will social justice, neither will causes or protests. None of that will matter in eternity. All that matters is truth. And it's not your truth, and it's not my truth, but it's God's truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. Nobody makes it to eternal life apart from Jesus Christ. So I ask you the question, five minutes into eternity, what will be your prevailing thoughts? Yes, there is memory in eternity. In heaven, God erases every sorrowful memory. It's like he cleans and resequences your hard drive. <laughs> and you'll have only great memories. But in hell, you'll remember every lost memory opportunity. The rich man ended up in hell, but he remembered every lost opportunity. Every time he drove by Lazarus at his gate begging food, he remembered that as a lost opportunity. He remembered his brothers who weren't serving God. He remembered everything that brought him pain and suffering. You say, preacher, are you trying to scare me? I'll tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to do everything in my power to get you to make heaven your home and to miss hell, whatever it takes. If the shoe fits, wear it, but don't go to hell. If you go to hell, it'll be over Jesus' dead body. Jude said, and of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fire pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. I'm here to tell you, Jesus is coming 
soon. I want you to find your place at an altar, and I want you to make sure of your salvation. I don't care how young you are, how old you are. I don't care how long you've known God or how long you haven't known God. Everybody in this building needs to leave here knowing you've got an assurance of eternal salvation. He's coming back in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we shall all be changed. We'll be caught up together with him in the air. You dare not be left behind. These altars are open. Make sure of your salvation. Make sure of your salvation. Make sure of your salvation. Jesus. 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 Save us, 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 Jesus. 